Hello, this is Mrs. Maddie Lee, and this is the first of the collaborates for the acute uh, neurology section. And this is one of them that you need to listen to prior to coming to class. So the purpose of this particular collaborate is to talk about what's normal. Uh, by understanding what is normal, then you will be better able to understand the neurological deficits and disorders that we'll talk about later on. For example, understanding the area of the brain associated with specific functions, such as speech, will help you to anticipate deficits relating to damage to this particular part of the brain. So giving you that baseline is what I'm really looking for here. The first couple of slides have your learning outcomes and also your cues. So I'm going to go ahead and just click through those. Okay, this is the first actual slide of the lecture. When we talk about the nervous system, there's two parts. There's the central nervous system that is um, comprised of the brain, the spinal cord, and the cranial nerves 1 and 2. And then there's the peripheral nervous system, which is cranial nerves 3 through 12, the spinal nerves, and the autonomic nervous system. The nervous system is responsible for the control and integration of the body's activities. All motor, sensory, autonomic, cognitive, and behavioral activities are controlled by the nervous system. And when you think about the nervous system, just think of it basically as an electrical um, kind of an electrical conduction system. It gets a stimuli, and the stimuli could either be an internal or an external stimuli, and then it communicates information from one part of the body to another part of the body. The nervous system has two types of cells, neurons and glial, G-L-I-A-L cells. We'll talk about glial cells in just, a, just on another slide, okay? So right now, we're just going to talk about the neurons. And when you think about the neuron, think of it as the nerve cell of the nervous system. I also want you to think about neurons as one-way streets. Impulses can only move one way on any particular neuron. What happens is that the dendrites, which are up there at the top there that look like little octopus tendrils, they are short processes and they extend from the cell body and they receive the impulses uh, from the axions of other neurons and conduct the impulses towards the cell body. Then coming down the slide, looking down there, that long skinny thing, that's the axion. The axion can be very different, varied diff distances. You can have axions that are as small as a couple of micrometers, or we actually have some neurons that have their axions are as long as a full meter. But regardless of what neuron we're talking about, there are three things that neurons always have in common. They have the ability to be, to the, the, um, they have the characteristic of excitability. And what I mean by excitability is they have the ability to generate a nerve impulse. They have the um, uh, characteristic of conductivity. And what I mean by that is the ability to transmit an impulse. And finally, they have the characteristic of influence, that they have the ability to influence something else. And that something else might be other neurons, it could be muscle cells, or it could be glandular cells. And the way that they influence this other um, element is by transmitting the impulse to them. Something else that you can see here on this um, axion, about halfway down, you can see that it has a little label out to the left that says myelin sheath. Some nerves have myelin sheaths and some do not. If a nerve has a myelin sheath, that's like kind of getting in the express lane, so to speak. And so if they've got a myelin sheath, then they can transmit that impulse quicker. Um, also, when you talk about regeneration of nerves, Typically, the regeneration of central nervous system axions are less successful than the regeneration of peripheral ner uh, nervous system axions. 
one reason is because the peripheral nervous system regeneration is supported because most of those neurons will go, grow back inside of that myelin sheath. And inside that myelin sheath are the Schwann cells. And since the Schwann cells are often undamaged, this is why people can go ahead and recover from neurological diseases such as Guillain-Barre. For a long time, we thought that neurons for themselves have been non-myotic. In other words, that once they were damaged, that they could not regenerate. However, we have found more and more information and evidence about the neuronal stem cells, so that now we can see that there is some neurogenesis that occurs in the adult brain after cerebral injury. And that's a new thought process for us. OK, at this point in the semester, you're probably feeling like this. You're stepping on my last nerve. Um, so we talked about neurons themselves. This slide talks about neurotransmitters. I'm going to touch on this briefly, but I want to tell you there's an excellent, excellent table in your book. It's table 56-1, and it talks about the neurotransmitters. It explains what their major functions are, and it also gives you some information about um, how changes in those neurotransmitters translate from a pathophysiology uh, disease development pr uh, perspective. So basically, a neurotransmitter is a chemical, and neurotransmitters impact the transmission of impulses across the synaptic cleft. And so basically, when I talk about that, I'm talking about you have a presynaptic terminal, then you have the synaptic cleft, and then you have the receptor site on the postsynaptic cell. And that, so the neurotransmitters help that impulse, so to speak, to jump across the gap. So if you think about um, neuron 1 and neuron 2 as being two different billions, and they've got the, some space between them, well, the neurotransmitters is what helps them to jump across that space between those two buildings so that they don't fall down between the two buildings and get lost. So anyhow, touching on a few of these neurotransmitters very, very briefly, acetylcholine. It was the very first neurotransmitter that was discovered, and its primary function is mediating the synaptic activity of the nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, the acetylcholine is really a big part of uh, the autonomic nervous system. It regulates skeletal muscles. In the uh, central nervous system, it plays a role in attention and arousal. And if you see a reduction in acetylcholine, you might see that translate as Alzheimer's or myasthenia gravis. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, I'm going to just have you think of those as part of the fight or flight uh, syndrome, OK? Serotonin, and we've had a lot of research into serotonin, and um, this has been an area that we've made a lot of progress with some of the uh, psych drugs. But anyhow, ser serotonin impacts moods, emotions, and sleep. Dopamine also impacts moods and emotions, and it also plays a role in regulating motor control. Whenever we have a destruction of the dopamine-secreting neurons, that's when we see Parkinson's show up. Uh, GABA. Uh, think, when you think GABA, think mother. Uh, GABA is the primary inhibitor transmitter of the central nervous system. So it plays a role in regulating the excitability of the neurons. So think, again, think mother, saying, oh, calm down, calm down. Um, we do use drugs that increase GABA with seizure disorders. Glutamate and aspartate have a role in memory and learning. And um, so when you see alterations in these, uh, that's these, this is the destructive factor in um, ALS. Endorphins and enkephalins are natural opioids. They give us a sense of well-being, and they produce analgesia. Uh, then also there's substance P. And substance P is also involved with the pain pathways, but we can block substance P with morphine. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. So we talked about the neurons, which are the nerve part of the nervous system. But the neurons can't get along without a supporting cast. So we've gone to the Oscars now. And so that supporting cast are the glial cells. Um, they provide support, nourishment, and protection to the neurons. Um, they are much, much more common. We have about five to 10 times more glial cells than we have neurons. And glial cells are divided into microglia and macroglia. 
The microglia are specialized macrophages, and they help to protect the neurons. They're very mobile within the brain, and they multiply very, very easily whenever the brain is damaged. Um, as far as macroglial cells, there's a couple of different types. The most common one are the astrocytes. Astrocytes are found primarily in the gray matter, and they give structural support to the neuron. Then we have the oglindodites. They're a specialized cell, and they are the cells that produce the myelin sheath of the nerve fibers of the central nervous system, and they're mainly found in the white matter. Then we have the epidemal cells, and they mine the brain ventricles, and we'll talk about the ventricles and the production of uh, cerebral spinal fluid here in just a little bit, but they mine the, um, the ventricles, and they play a role in the secretion of uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Whenever we talk about tumors of the uh, central nervous system, most commonly those tumors involve glial cells. Moving on, we're going to move to the spinal cord next. Um, there's actually uh, two slides. Yeah, basically two slides I'm going to talk about the spinal cord. This one here gives you a visual. So if you're a visual learner, you might want to hang out on this slide. If you're better with words, you might want to hang out on the next slide. But the bottom line is that the spinal cord extends from the medulla. It contains both white and gray matter. In the spinal cord, the gray matter is in the center. The gray matter is that stuff there that looks like an H, kind of a, a squatty, uh, short, fat H there, OK? Um, and so in the spinal cord, we've got the gray matter in the middle, and we've got the white matter on the outside. And the reason I'm saying this and kind of stopping here and yakking a little bit about it is because that is exactly opposite of the gray and the white matter in the brain, OK? So the spinal cord gray and white matter is opposite of the um, gray and white matter in the brain. Um, it's very similar to the brain in the sense that it's surrounded by the meninges, the dura, the arachnoid, and the peel layers of that. Um, the white mat matter might be myelinated, it might be unmyelinated. And just to kind of, this is an important thing to remember, we think that the posterior portion of the spinal cord deals with sensory, and the anterior portion deals with motor. An easy way to remember that is A for action, OK? Then moving on to the next slide, we've just kind of got some of the same information only kind of written out for you. Um, we've got the gray and the white matter. We um, also want to talk a little bit about ascending and descending tracks. So um, with the ascending tracks, these carry sensory information to higher levels of the central nervous system. And then the descending tracks carry impulses that are responsible for muscle movement, OK? Then Within this, we're also going to think about upper motor neurons and lower, lower motor neurons. Um, upper, oh, excuse me, lower motor neurons send the axions that innervate the skeletal muscle of the arms, trunk, and legs, and they're located in the anterior horn of the corresponding segments of the spinal cord. Um, Lower motor neurons, if we have lesions of the lower motor neurons, we're going to have symptoms such as weakness or paralysis, denervation atrophy, which I think I, I actually don't have that written up there on the slide for you as to specifically, but it's denervation, D-E-N-E-R-V-A-T-I-O-N, OK? But denervation atrophy. Then we're going to have hyporeflexia or aflexia, OK? Either hyporeflexia or areflexia. We're going to see decreased muscle, muscle tone, and that's going to be shown in the form of flaccidity, OK? So lower motor neurons, you're going to see flaccid muscles, OK? As opposed to upper motor neurons, they originate in the cerebral cortex and project downward. If you were to have a 
upper motor neuron lesion, then you're still going to see things like weakness and paralysis, which we already would see in the um, lower as well. The atrophy here you would see from disuse, so it would be disuse atrophy. Now, in contrast, you would see hyperreflexia and increased muscle tone, which would translate as spasticity. So see the differences there? Okay. This is a reflex arc, and this picture is actually taken out of your book. I'm not going to talk about it. I just wanted you to kind of realize what are the elements of a reflex arc and kind of have the picture here for you to look at. We're going to move on to the brain now, and there's going to be several slides about the brain. Okay, so this slide itself is an overall picture of the brain. The brain's divided into the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem, and you can see that there on your picture. Okay, the cerebrum consists of um, two hemispheres, a right and a left hemisphere. The cerebrum also contains the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the connections for the cranial nerves 1 and 2, and the basal ganglia, okay? The brain stem, which is down there towards the bottom, okay? It consists of the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, and the connections for cranial nerves 4 through 12. The right and left hemisphere of the cerebrum is separated by the sulcus fissure, okay? The outer surface is gray matter, and the cerebral cortex is made up of neurons, and the inner layer is made of white matter, which is made up of the nerve fibers that form pathways. So remember, this is exactly opposite of the spinal cord. The cerebral hemisphere is divided into lobes, and I'm going to talk about those lobes in a minute, okay? The brain stem, I already told you, consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And just be aware that many cranial nerves originate from the brain stem. The brain stem regulates temperature, pulse, respiration. A part of the brain called the dicephalon, and it's spelled D I E N C E P H A L O N. I'm going to spell it again D I E N. C E P H A L O N contains the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and the pituitary gland. We consider this to be the bobbler area. The midbrain connects the pons. Okay. The medulla contains motor fibers from the brain to the spinal cord and the sensory fibers from the spinal cord to the brain. And those nerve fibers cross over there. The cerebellum is involved with coordination and balance, movement, our positioning, and fine motor control. The basal ganglia controls purposeful movement. And the limbic system refers to the area lateral of the hypothalamus, and it plays a big role in behavior and sexual drive. Now, the next slide we're going to go to, this one shows you the brain from a structural standpoint. The next slide we're going to go to, I've got two pictures on it, and it shows you the brain from a functional standpoint. Okay, so here we are. The, one, the picture on the left only shows the cerebrum, but it tells you a lot about the different functions. So I thought that would kind of be helpful. It shows you the lobes, but it also shows you where, you know, speech and frontal association, the motor cortex, auditory association. So it does a good job of showing you the functions. But it, that picture is only the cerebrum, okay? Then the picture to the right, the reason I included it, it, show, it does a better job of pointing out where the lobes are, and it shows the whole brain here. Okay, so you've got the cerebrum, you've got all the rest of the brain. The other reason that I included this is it does a really good job of showing you where the Broca's area is, and it really does a good job of showing you where the gyruses are. So I, it, both these pictures bring different things to you, so I wanted to include them both. So we're going to talk a little bit about the cerebrum to start out with, okay? The frontal lobe, um, well, I guess I should back up. Uh, the, the cerebrum has four lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, 
the temporal lobe and the occipital lobe. Okay? The frontal lobe controls our higher cognitive functioning. It's things like planning, organizing, our emotional and behavioral control, our short-term memory, voluntary eye movement, voluntary movement, and Broca's area. The, this is our area that deals with expressing language. So it's the speech area, Broca's area, B-R-O-C-A apostrophe S. This is often, this frontal lobe is often thought of as where our personality comes from. The thing that helps me remember this particular part of the brain is this is the part of the brain that really kind of filters what we do. So I think of the frontal lobe as my mother, okay, that's mother saying, okay, calm down. Don't go jumping off that bridge yet. You got to think about the consequences of that. So when you think about the frontal lobe, think higher level functioning, higher thought process, and think about your mother who is always telling you, caution, 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 okay? Then we've got the uh, temporal lobe, and this has our auditory data, the interpretation of some visual data, and it contains Wernicke's speech area. Now, Wernicke's speech area has to do with understanding language. And understanding this is important as we get down later on when we talk about stroke, okay? Um, then we have the parietal uh, lobe, which interprets our spatial information and contains the sensory cortex. And then finally, the occipital lobe back there in the back. The occipital lobe is the endpoint of the optic tract, and this is where we process sight. Okay, I talked about Broca's area, and I talked about Wernicke's area. So they have the two pieces of speech, the understanding of speech and the expressing of speech. One of the interesting and sometimes uh, bad things when we have a, a stroke is that um, Broca's area and Wernicke's area share a couple of things in common. First off, they're both on the left side of the brain. Okay, so they're already on the left side of the brain. So if you have a left-sided uh, brain injury, you've got increased risk of impacting these areas. Then on top of that, they also share the same blood supply. So that's why so often we'll see both aspects of speech impacted when we have an insult uh, to the brain if it's in the left brain area. Okay, moving on. Um, the basal ganglia, thalamus, hypothalamus, and limbic system are also located in the cerebrum. The basal ganglia are a group of structures that are located centrally in the cerebrum and the midbrain, and their function is the initiation, execution, and completion of voluntary movements. They impact learning, emotional response, and some of our autonomic um, movements associated with skeletal muscle activity, such as how our arms swing. We don't think about the fact that our arms swing when we walk, so um, that uh, falls in that category. Other uh, functions are swallowing, um, saliva, and uh, blinking. The thalamus is part of the dicephalon and lies directly above the brain stem, okay? Um, it's the major relay center for the afferent inputs of the cerebral cortex. Then we have the hypothalamus, which is located just inferior or just below the thalamus and slightly in front of the midbrain. It regulates the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. We also have the limbic system, which is located near the inner surfaces of the cerebral hemispheres. It's concerned with emotion, aggression, feeding behavior, and sexual response. Okay? Oops. Uh, so then the next uh, slide we're going to go to talks about the brain stem. The brain stem consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the midbrain. We have ascending and descending fibers to and from the cerebrum and cerebellum passed through the brain stem. The nuclei of the cranial nerves 3 through 12 are in the brain stem. We've got the reticular formation also in the brain stem. The function of the reticular system is relaying sensory information, influencing both the excitatory and inhibitory control of the spinal motor spinal motor neurons and controlling the vasomotor and respiratory activity. 
Um, it's a complex system. It requires communication between the brain stem, the reticular formation, and the cerebral cortex. So it's responsible for arousal and sleep-wake transitions. The vital sign centers of concern with respiratory, vasomotor, and cardiac function are located in the medulla. And then the brainstem also contains the centers for sneezing, coughing, vomiting, sucking, and swallowing. Moving on to the cerebellum. I like this slide because to me it puts it all together. Uh, the bottom line about the cerebellum is uh, it coordinates voluntary movement. It helps us with balance, in other words, trunk stability and our equilibrium. It gets information from the cerebral cortex and also from our muscles and joints and then the inner ear, which plays a big uh, role in our balance. So think of it as influencing motor activity. And you can see it tucked back there in the back and it's uh, below the cerebrum, so you can see it tucked back there. But with her balancing on the one foot and trying to pull her shoe on, that kind of puts it all together for me. So like I said, I like this particular picture to go along with the text. We're going to move on and we're going to talk about the ventricles now. The brain has four ventricles. They're interconnected fluid-filled cavities. Um, there, of the four ventricles, the fourth ventricle is in, is in the central canal of the lower brain stem. And it, then the brain, uh, after we get past the brain stem, then we have a spinal canal that extends the full length of the spinal cord, which is what gives us um, the, the ability to have the uh, CFS um, involved. So talking about cerebral spinal fluid, it circulates within the subarachnoid space in the surrounding areas, OK? And you can kind of see that picture here. Um, the two largest of the ventricles are the lateral ventricles in the cerebrum. The third ventricle is in the decephalon of the forebrain between the right and left thalamus. And the fourth ventricle, like I said, is located at the back of the pons and the upper half of the medulla oblongata. And the ventricles are concerned with the production and circulation of the cerebral spinal fluid. We're going to move over to a slide that talks about CFS next. So the cerebral spinal fluid is produced in the choroid plexus of the ventricle. It provides cushioning for the brain and the spinal cord. And it also allows for fluid shifts from the cranial cavity to the spinal cavity. It carries nu nutrients. We produce um, spinal fluid all the time, OK? Um, I want you to think, the number I want you to remember, well, I'm going to tell you we produce five to 700 cc's per day. But the number I want you to remember, because we'll talk about it later when we talk about monitoring increased ICP. The number I want you to remember is we produce about 20 to 30 cc's per hour, OK? Um, the ventricles and the central canal at any given time is filled with about an average of 135 milliliters of uh, cerebral um, uh, spinal uh, uh, CSS. Um, hold on, I'm going to pause because Mary Jane needs something. I have to figure out how to pause this. Although I really don't know how to pause it. Hmm. I'm going to have to just text her back and tell her that I can't pause because I don't know how to. Um, OK, let me get back to what I was saying. Uh, we talked about the average amount, OK? When there's trauma to the head, the uh, blood enters the system and can cause obstruction of the villi and hydrocephalus results. Um, the uh, central, the cerebral spinal fluid provides nourishment, removes waste, and cushions the brain. We circulate through the ventricles, and it's produced in the choroid plexus. And I think I'm repeating myself now because I got off cycle here. Uh, typically, the cerebral spinal fluid is a clear fluid and is circulated around the brain through the ventricles. After circulation around the brain and the arachnoid villi then absorb the CSS. Uh, typically, the CSS is clear, and it does not have any red blood cells in it, OK? The blood bar brain barrier is formed by the endothelial cells of the brain's capillaries, which form a continuous tight junction, creating the barrier. All um, substances entering the cerebral spinal fluid is filtered through the blood-brain barrier. Okay, so that blood-brain barrier acts as protection. 
but it can be impacted by cerebral edema and cerebral hypoxia. When we have an excessive amount of buildup of CSF, we end up with hydrocephalus. Um, if we're going to do an analysis of CSF, this can give us some useful diagnostic information related to some of the nervous system diseases. Uh, we often measure um, the CSF pressure in patients with actual or suspected intracranial injury. An increased intracranial pressure is indicated by increased CSF pressure. If we have too much pressure inside of the cranium, this can cause a downward or central herniation of the brain and the brain stem. Okay. Okay. I went and I helped Mary Jane, so I hope that this really did stop while I was gone. I tried to rush as fast as I could in case it didn't. Okay. We're done. Okay, we're moving on from this slide. <coughs> we're going to talk about the meninges. Um, and the meninges, all the meninges are is a, are a fibrous cover of the brain. It's got several different layers, okay? We have the outermost layer, which is the dura mater, D-U-R-A-M-A-T-E-R, -E which should be, actually it doesn't say that on here. There's the dura mater. Um, and this is a thick, um, it's a, it's a thick um, layer, it's gray, and it's inelastic. Then we've got a middle layer, that middle layer is the arachnoid layer. It's very thin, it's a very delicate membrane, and it looks like a spider web, that's why it's called arachnoid. Um, it's white, the arachnoid layer has no blood supply. In this arachnoid layer is where the arachnoid villi exist that absorb the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. The subdural space is between the dura and the arachnoid. Okay? Then the third layer, the innermost layer, is the pia matter. And this is a very thin, transparent layer, and it's just like saran wrap. It just hugs that brain, okay? So then when we think about the subarachnoid space, this is the space between the arachnoid and the pia mater. Whenever we have bleeding from trauma, we name it according to where it's located in relationship to the meninges that we just talked about. This is a slide showing you the major arteries of the brain. I do not expect you to memorize all these arteries, okay? Uh, but a general knowledge of the distribution of the major arteries helps us to understand and evaluate the signs and symptoms of cerebral vascular diseases and trauma, okay? Um, in general, the blood supply of the brain arises from the internal carotid arteries and the uh, vertebral arteries, which are shown in the slide there. The next slide also talks about cerebral um, uh, circulation. Um, this one slide gives you a picture of the cerebral circulation. Um, this is a slide you might want to come back to when we talk about um, CBAs later on, okay? But the internal carotid arteries provide the blood flow to both the anterior and middle portions of the uh, cerebrum. We've got the vertebral arteries to join, uh, to form the basilar artery and provide blood flow to the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the posterior cerebrum. You've got the circle of Willis, which is formed by the commuting arteries that join the basilar and the internal carotid arteries. The circle of Willis acts as a safety valve. It helps to regulate cerebral blood flow when there's differences in pressure or when you have a vascular occlusion. Then superior to the circle of Willis, you've got three pairs of arteries that supply blood to the left and the right hemispheres. You've got the anterior cerebral artery that feeds the medial and anterior portions of the frontal lobe. You've got the middle cerebral artery that feeds the outer portions of the frontal parietal and superior temporal lobes. And the posterior cerebral artery feeds the medial portions of the occipital and inferior temporal lobes. 
The venous blood then drains from the brain to the dural sinuses and it forms channels that then drains into the two jugular veins. This is just an overview. I'm not going to ask you a bunch of questions about these arteries, okay? Um, the brain does have some protective mechanisms. We have the blood-brain barrier, which is a physiologic barrier between the blood capillaries and the brain tissue. It protects the brain from harmful agents while at the same time allowing nutrients to enter. And you can see up there on the slide, it tells you that, that lipid-soluble agents are much more successful in passing through the blood-brain barrier. Then we also have the skull, which is a protective um, uh, measure for the brain as well. Um, the, you can, it tells you up there you've got eight cranial bones and 14 facial bones. The reason I have the forum and magnum listed on here is it's the largest opening and the, this is the opening to which the brain stem extends down into the spinal cord and this foramen offers the only major space for the expansion of the brain contents when we have increased intracranial pressure. And we don't want that to happen, by the way. We don't because that is what we call herniation, whenever the brain extends down through that form and magnum, and uh, that's a bad thing. So that wraps up the central nervous system. We're going to move on to the peripheral now. The peripheral nervous system, it tells you there on the slide, contains the cranial nerves 3 through 12, the spinal nerves, and the autonomic nervous system. The next slide is going to show you a crosscut of the spinal um, columns. Okay, so when we think about the spinal nerves, um, each spinal cord segment contains spinal nerves, okay? And when we think about a spinal nor nerve, I want you to think of it as a pair. So a spinal nerve is going to have a dorsal central, excuse me, a dorsal sensory nerve fiber root and also a ventral motor fiber root, okay? So you've got to have two pieces. You've got to have a sensory piece and you've got to have a motor piece in order for you to have a full spinal nerve. Um, let's see. The cell bodies of the voluntary motor system are in the anterior horn of the spinal cord gray matter. And the cell bodies of the autonomic or involuntary motor system are in the anterior lateral portion of the spinal cord gray matter. The cell bodies of the sensory fibers are in the dorsal root ganglia just outside of the spinal um, cord. Okay? Um, so once that nerve exits the spinal column, it divides into a ventral and a dorsal, a dorsal section. And then this is a collection of motor and sensory fibers, and eventually that goes to the peripheral parts of the body. And that's how we move uh, the nerves from the impulses uh, to and from through the spinal cord. Okay? Uh, spinal nerves themselves, I'm not going to really say anything about this. It's pretty much on the slide. I'm just going to remind you, ventral equals anterior, anterior equals motor. Remember, A anterior action, dorsal equals posterior, posterior equals sensory. We'll talk about German tones in a minute. This picture just shows you the spinal column and spinal, the vertebrae provide structure and they give us our posture, but they provide structure. They also help to protect the spinal cord. We've got the ligaments that also provide support, okay? When you think about the um, vertebral brain, it's ver vertebral bones, there are seven uh, cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar. Then you've got uh, five sacral, but they're actually fused into one, okay? And then you've got four coccygeal, but they're also fused into one. When you think about the spinal nerves, they're divided into eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal coccygeal, which it shows you on there, okay? But an easy way to remember that is breakfast at 8, that associates with your cervical, lunch at 12, that's your thoracic, and dinner at 5, that's your lumbar, okay? Remember, each nerve has a ventral root and a dorsal root, and, you know, and like we talked about on the previous slide, remember, um, remember A is for action, and that'll help you remember the difference between motor and sensory. Uh, this slide is here just to give you a little bit of an overview. It shows you the nerve 
and then it also shows you how that translates over to the dermatomes. I am not expecting you to know about these dermatomes, okay? The main reason I'm showing this to you is that if you can look at a picture um, of dermatomes, if you have a patient who's uh, complaining of um, numbness in a particular area, then if you look at the dermatome, a lot of times you can figure out which nerve is being impacted. These are the cranial nerves. The cranial nerves are uh, a set of nerves that you do have to know, okay? I'm not going to go through them, but you do need to know them, okay? Uh, the cranial nerves are 12 paired nerves, and they have cell bodies um, with nerve fibers that in exit the uh, cranial cavity. Now, they are somewhat different than spinal nerves because, remember, spinal nerves has to have two pieces, okay? It has to have both a sensory and a motor fiber. That's not necessarily true of cranial nerves. Some cranial nerves have only a sensory piece, some have only a motor piece, and some have both. Okay? Um, in your textbook, you've got table 56-3 that runs you through the cranial nerves and the functions of those cranial nerves. I'm not going to lecture on this. You can look at that table and you can learn them. Uh, you should have learned them back in 101, but you can refresh yourself. You do need to know about the cranial nerves because later on when I talk about them, I'm going to talk about them specifically related to function and specifically related to being able to recognize an injury or an insult um, by some of the um, uh, symptoms that we see, okay? So moving on to the autonomic nervous system. So there's two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Um, when we think about the sympathetic, um, I want you, it's pretty easy, think of it as fight or flight, and the main neurotransmitter is norepinephrine. Parasympathetic, it's mostly visceral functions, the main trans, neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. And they kind of work in concert. For example, if the sympathetic nervous system would increase the rate and force of your heart contraction, okay? So you'd have, you know, stronger heart contraction, fast pulse. By contrast, the um, parasympathetic nervous system is going to decrease the rate and the uh, force of, of your heart, okay? So it kind of, they kind of work in pairs. And this, um, the autonomic nervous system we already talked about, but reminder, it's regulated uh, by centers in the spinal cord, brainstem, and hypothalamus. Um, as far as diagnostics are concerned, one of the most common things that you see is a lumbar puncture. However, and this is important to remember, um, we would not do a lumbar puncture if we have any reason to believe there's increased intracranial pressure. We also would not do it if there's an infection at the site of the puncture. But if we have any suspicion at all that there's increased intracranial pressure, we do not do a lumbar puncture. Um, You've got a table in your book again, it's table 56-8, and it's got a really good chart with the different diagnostic tests. And it doesn't just have the diagnostic test, but it also has the associated nursing responsibilities. So that would be a good table to look at, as well as table 56-9, uh, um, which has the normal um, CSF values, okay? We can use a CSF analysis to give us uh, some clues as to what's going on. When we look at the CSF sample, the fluid should be clear, colorless, odorless, and it should be free of any red blood cells. It should have very little protein. Later on, one of the things we'll talk about is if there's blood in the CSF, that that is a really significant and not very good sign. Um, you can read in your book how to do a lumbar puncture and the um, nursing functions related to that. Uh, CT scan, um, this is a, just a radiographic image of the brain and we can take a variety of CT scans in succession and then when you look at the different pictures one after the other this gives us a, kind of a three-dimensional representation of the um, brain or the intracranial content. Um, in a CT, you're going to have the dense material show up as white, but you're going to see fluid or air come back as kind of a darker color or perhaps even uh, black. We can do a CT with or without uh, contrast. 
Then we have MRIs. In this case, it's a, a greater detail than a CT. It gives us um, better resolution of the intracranial structures. Uh, but it does require a longer period of time to complete. And so in an emergency situation, you might go with a CT instead of an MRI. Um, we can also use an MRI to um, evaluate uh, the brain's response to stimuli through a time-related uh, set of images. So that's another uh, function we can use the MRI for. When uh, These are some more diagnostic studies. Um, a cerebral angiography, we can use it, and like the slide tells you, for suspected vascular lesions or tumors. We can identify abscesses, aneurysms, hematomas, um, arterial venous malformations. We can also see spasms and some tumors. We, uh, the way we do this is we put a catheter inserted into typically the femoral artery. Sometimes it's brachial, but usually femoral. We pass it through the aortic arch and into the base of the carotid or the vertebral um, artery and then we inject contrast media. We do a series of um, images and, and so we watch the contrast flow through. So if you're using a contrast and you've already had um, immune, we've already talked about uh, reactions, so something you need to be aware of is that we're using, we're instilling this contrast so the patient's at risk for a um, reaction which could include such a thing as an endophlastic reaction. Um, then looking at um, electrographic studies, uh, we could do an EEG, and the slide tells you it's a recording of the electrical activity. We can use it to assess seizure disorders, sleep disorders, cerebrovascular lesions, and brain injury. Um, Electromyography, um, that's a recording of the electrical activity associated with the uh, nerves of the skeletal system. We use needle electrode, uh, electrodes that are inserted into the muscle to record specific motor units. Um, the normal muscle at rest would not show any electric, electrical activity, and we see the electric, electrical activity only when the muscle contracts. Um, Nerve conduction, that involves the application of electrical stimulus to the distal portion of a sensory or mixed nerve and recording the resulting depolarization wave. Um, we measure the time between when we uh, initiate the stimulus and that um, depolarization wave at the recording electrode. Um, that time is, is called the nerve conduction velocity. We can do evoked potentials. Um, they're involved with the sensory pathways. We put electrodes on specific parts of the skin and scalp to record the electrical activity. Um, let's see what else I want to say about that. Some reasons that we might um, do this is that we can use it to um, look for abnormalities of the visual or auditory system because it shows whether or not the sensory impulse is reaching the um, appropriate part of the brain. We can also use this to evaluate for consciousness. We use it to examine optic neuritis in multiple sclerosis and also um, acoustic neuroma. And we're going to move to the last slide. Maybe. Well, there it is. Oh, some impacts of aging. Um, there are several parts of the nervous system that's impacted by aging. You're going to, in the central nervous system, you're going to see a gradual loss of the neurons um, in certain areas of the brainstem, cerebellum, and cerebral cortex. Um, we can start to see this loss begin even in early adulthood. As we have a loss in neurons, you've got a widening of the ventricles. You're going to see a decrease in brain weight. The cerebral blood flow decreases, and the production of CSF also declines. Um, in the peripheral nervous system, you can see some degenerative changes in the myelin. And remember, myelin helps our nerve impulses to move faster. So if you've got degeneration in the myelin, you've got slower movement of the nerve impulses. Um, it's changes in the peripheral nervous system that account for the issues with orthostatic hypotension with older adults. Um, they can also see changes in, in the form of decreases in memory, vision, hearing, taste, smell, um, positional sense, in other words, balance, 
uh, muscle strength and reaction time. One of the things that we see also with the age is a decrease in the taste and smell perception. And because of that, a lot of times people are not, uh, they kind of lose their appetite because they lose that sensation of taste and smell, which really kind of helps to drive our appetite. We see increased balance and coordination problems that puts an elderly person at risk for falls. That wraps up this review of the nervous system, and I'm going to sign off with that.